then I'll stand up and is that, yeah, got it, okay. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. So, so you know, they, they asked if I would, if I would give a little talk about sort of research life as a, as a researcher, as a career option, because I know that's one of the things people are considering and I've talked to some people today. And I said, yes, as long as it's fairly informal. So I don't have slides. Um, I have some notes of things to talk about that I want to cover, but it isn't that large a group, which is, which is good. I do want to keep it informal. So, so stop me and ask questions, or I'm going to try to, we, you know, we set up just half an hour. I've got some other meetings with people. Feel free to reach out to me. My email is really easy to find at the University of Exeter is probably the best, but just Google my name. You can find my email. So feel free to reach out. I'm happy to chat with people in general, but I'll also try to, leave a little bit of time for questions here as well because the point is to be useful and, and say something that's that's helpful uh, as you're thinking through this. So so I wanted to start a little bit, I'll try to cover roughly my, my background um, and and the research career I've had, which which does span a few different elements. And then maybe a little bit about what skills are useful, sort of how to identify if this might be a right a right path for you or something you want to spend some time on. Um, the trade-offs between having impact as a researcher versus versus other ways, um, what life is like day to day, and, and maybe maybe as part of that, some of the current projects I'm working on, which also gives you some sense of, of what's happening. So I'll try to go through those, and then I may have some other things, or I may leave them, and, and if nobody has questions, I'm sure I can keep talking for a while and cover some of it. So so I, I do come from kind of a researchy background. Um, my great-grandfather studied physics at the University of Chicago under Robert Millikan, one of the great physicists and Nobel Prize winners, and then he became a professor at a random university in the US. Um, I have teachers in my family, so great grandmother, my gr grandmother on the other side were teachers. Both of my grandfathers have PhDs. Uh, my mom and dad, my uncle, my aunt, my sister all have PhDs, many of them are professors. So this is like the family business that I'm in, so that's a little bit different background. On the other hand, it means I do have a pretty good sense. Like I've grown up with this and I, I do have a feel for the different ways to go about it. And not everybody was academic. Actually, both of my grandfathers were working more in, in industry and applied work with their, with their doctorates. Um, my father is a, is a health economist. I'm an economist. I'll say a little bit more about, about mine. I'll try to go this quickly. He's a health economist and he's worked a lot internationally. He's worked on randomized controlled trials. He's worked with the Gates Foundation. He was the lead author of the 1993 World Development Report from the World Bank, which may or may not mean anything, but it was on health. So every year, this is a flagship publication of the World Bank uh, on a different topic, infrastructure, labor, technology, whatever. So there was one on health in 1993. Uh, the work was done in, in the early 90s. And this was, this was actually kind of a big deal for the bank at the time because they really did like dams and macroeconomics. And so something like health to the traditional economists was like touchy-feely and fuzzy. And can you really quantify that? And I, and I say this partly to, to talk about the impact that I think he's had, but partly also to say this research approach of being able to quantify things, being rigorous about things, sometimes in surprising ways, can, can go far. So they, they helped develop the DALI concept, the Disability Adjusted Life Year, if you, if you know that, Qualies and DALI, so he was one of the originators of that, and really tried to just put on the same basis how much death and disability is there from different causes around the world, from different health outcomes, and nobody had done that before. And just that measurement side, I really like measurement. I think it's underappreciated, I think it's fascinating. But just that measurement side turned out to make a big difference. Because if you went and asked the polio people how many people die of polio every year, and you asked the tuberculosis people how many people die of tuberculosis, and you asked the lung cancer people how many die of lung cancer, and you asked this of all the people and you add up all the numbers, you get about three times the total deaths in the world. Something's off. You know, so people will die from multiple things or they exaggerate the numbers. So just forcing it to add up and saying, all right, this is the burden of disease, and became this whole initiative on global burden of disease, really made a big difference. Bill Gates was asked by a reporter some years later, you know, what has influenced you in your giving? And he pointed to this report, the 1993 WDR, and said, this, is, this made a huge difference. This is one of the reasons I chose global health. So if you want to talk about having an impact as a researcher, as somebody sort of doing measurement things, boring, adding numbers up, I don't find it boring, but a lot of people do, and I kind of understand why this really can have an influence. And so it's affected um, what's, what's happened at the World Bank and the WHO and, and Gates Foundation and elsewhere. And you know, probably someone else said this about, about my father, I'm just saying it, he's probably saved many more lives than any clinician or doctor who's ever lived, probably orders of magnitude more lives, but in probabilistic terms. So that's one of the things I wanna say about research is you won't have, very unlikely to have the direct concrete impact. 
So it's much more likely, you can have a lot of impact, but it's much more likely that it's gonna be delayed. It's much more likely that it's gonna be probabilistic or uncertain. You're not gonna be able to point to this life I saved or this product I introduced and, and I grew the EA community or all these other things. So it's, it's, it's this diffuse longer term impact. And for some of us, that's fine. For some people that doesn't fit their personality and totally understandable. So I sort of wanna think about that and, and take that into account. So that's a bit, a bit on the background and, and a bit on um, one aspect. As was mentioned, so I've, I've worked in academia. I'm a professor at the University of Exeter now and a research affiliate at the Global Priorities Institute uh, here at Oxford. I'm also a research affiliate at JPAL, the Poverty Action Lab based at MIT. Uh, does a lot of development economics. So I do behavioral, I do development, I do policy, measurement issues and methodology, normative issues now, so quite a mix. And that is one thing I would say many researchers end up becoming very focused on one area. And that may be what you typically have in mind. And, and that's not a bad stereotype to have because a lot of people do. And if you want to have as much impact as possible in the academic world, that's the way to go. You want to be the person on this topic, like the go-to person. You know. I don't find that quite as interesting, so I've moved around. And I did game theory, and I've done experimental economics and behavioral economics, and I did policy work in the US government, and now at the World Bank, and, and development, and now getting into the last few years more sort of, some of that was EA related on, on global health and development and cash transfers. But now I'm doing a little bit more sort of straight up, you might think of EA type work on normative issues and population ethics and well being and survey measures. And that's fine. I, maybe I'll keep doing this forever because it's really exciting and ambitious and I love the group. But maybe in 10 years I'll get bored of this and do something else. And that's fine. That's perfectly possible. In fact, having the sort of basic set of skills that uh, I'm an economist, so I'm a little biased there. But I would say economics is one of the good fields where you have the quantitative skills, you have the social science skills behavioral science skills, a nice mix, and then it can be applied lots of different places. So it, it leaves a lot of things open. So that's briefly on my background, again, happy to say more about that. So what kinds of skills, I've, I've said some of this already. <clears throat> I do think sort of technical skills are important. I mean, you don't have to have them coming in, but you have to be willing to learn them. Um, and one of the attributes, I already talked a little bit about the timing, sort of patience, being willing things to take a while. And, and uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not saying that's necessarily right for everyone. I'm sure it isn't. I'm not even necessarily saying it's going to have the highest impact. Um, there may be things that you think you can do that will have an, uh, an impact in the next few years. And research-wise, that's not impossible, but, but less likely. Um, so I do think the expected impact is very high in research. Maybe the very, very far right right hand tail is a little bit lower for research. So the chance of doing something that's like completely gonna change the world is a little bit lower than if you're solving AI alignment. Um, but I think for somebody who's got basically the right personality and, and the right set of skills and is willing to work and willing to have the patience to take the time, and I don't, I don't, don't mean that in a normative sense, like those are all good things, this is just sort of descriptive. If that sounds like you or something you might be interested in, I think you can really have a good chance of having a big impact because it is pretty, foundational, it is pretty fundamental, and it's pretty responsive to a lot of different areas. So thinking in those terms is probably something that's, that's good and, and a useful skill. And thinking of the, the quantitative element, I, mean, I do quantitative research, not all research is quantitative, but I do think there's a real strength there. And being interested, seeing the value, let's put it that way, of really rigorous analysis. So, so roughly speaking, thinking of a trade-off where you could answer a big important question in a decent way, or a slightly narrower, not a minor question, but a slightly narrower, medium-sized question really, really cleanly, like really nail it down. And there's pros and cons of each of those. There's no right answer, but the researcher is more in the second one. So if, if what you're comfortable with or what you want to do is more, let's just get our best guess. And I do work with policymakers, and there it's much more like, we have to do something. There has to be a decision to be made. Let's take the evidence we have and make the best, the best choice we can. That's totally fair, and I get that, and I argue with some of my researcher friends who don't want to go that far at all. I think sometimes you need to, but the research mindset is not that one. The research mindset is take the biggest question you can where you're sure you can answer it, or pretty sure you can answer it, or you can give a really clean answer. And so either if that doesn't speak to you as much, or if, if it seems like counting the angels that can dance on the head of a pin to you, which is not an unfair perspective, then, then probably a little bit less 
a maybe a little bit less good fit for, for research. Um, reading articles, reading, so this is getting into a little bit also sort of how, how to find out, how to expose yourself if you're potentially curious. Reading academic journal articles. So even if that's not the kind of research you think you want to do, that's basically the job description for most researchers, all academic researchers, and even a lot of researchers. So I worked in the research department at the World Bank. Kind of that's what they're trying to do is publish articles. Now, you, don't, you certainly don't have to do that. You can use research skills to do something else. But what you will be trained for is to do that. And so if that's not something that excites you at all, then, and, and this was advice actually my, my mother gave to my cousin who was trying to figure out whether to get a PhD many years ago uh, in sociology, I believe. My mother said, go read academic sociology journals. And my cousin came back and said, that's really boring. Like, I, like, I, I can't believe people spend their time doing this stuff. And she was, I, I, she's a school teacher. She's wonderful. She's a good person. But I think she, probably that's a fair perspective. It is a bit boring. Um, and if you're not willing to spend a few years of your life getting into that and being trained to do that kind of thing, then less good fit. On the other hand, if you see it and say, wow, that's really interesting. You could dive into this question so deeply. Didn't think it would occur to anyone to look at all those details, but that's kind of cool. And you can really get a good answer to it. Then, then you know, maybe, maybe good fit. But, but it's also to know like that's, that is kind of what you're doing. And you can work obviously on research in, in operational areas and governments and for think tanks and nonprofits and elsewhere that very much have this policy broadly construed impact, but still your angle of it is, is really about that. And, and as much as I do care about having an impact and, and that's why I've chosen the areas that I work in and that's why I'm here, honestly at heart, I think it's, it's like the curiosity and learning and I, it's like I just want to do this stuff because I'm really curious what the answer is. And, and I hope that it has an impact and I try to put time in to have an impact. But if it weren't the case that I really, really enjoyed the research itself, you know, I don't think you could spend years and decades of your life doing it. So I wouldn't do it just for the impact or just to get a job or a position you think a PhD is required for. It, it's, you know, it's a lot of years of your life. You have to enjoy it to some extent uh, along the way. Um, yeah, I've said I've said a little bit of various things. I can I can say what a little bit what life is like as a researcher and and maybe some of the projects I'm doing. Um, a lot of research now is is much more interdisciplinary, uh, much more in groups and teams. So it's not so much the stereotype of you know a lone person thinking hard about a problem in their room. Some of that does still happen. Uh, you can do you can do that version of it. You can do very good research like that, but that's a pretty small fraction right now. Uh, so I would, uh, both, I would say, don't be turned off by thinking that's what research is. And so if you're a more people-oriented person and team-oriented person, then, then I think it can actually work really well. Um, I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of calls every day for, for projects. So I have a project now in Kenya, which is um, micro-entrepreneurship. It's cash transfers and mobile phone-based business skills training and some behavioral interventions on future self, getting people to think about the future, and peer networks. It's a complicated project. This is like 9,318 9, people in our sample, I happen to know. Um, working with the government of Kenya, it's a World Bank project. So the overall loan is like a $200 million loan to the government. We've got this really large sample size, which is great. We're working with the government, which is a pain in the neck, but also really great, because then things can actually happen and scale up. But there's a lot to go on there. So some of what we're doing is kind of substantive, research side, figuring out what should the treatments look like and how do we design the evaluation and what should our survey look like at the end. Um, but a lot of it is also project management and hiring the team and training the team that's implementing the surveys and dealing with the government partner and, and, and the money and talking to the people on the ground. Um, so, so, you know, a weekly call is about that and about various other projects I'm doing. Um, some of it is, is writing um, and a lot of it is reading Especially, I'm a little, you know, a little bit. Further. I don't want to say senior. I'm not senior. I'm, I'm young, just not as young as all of you, most of you. Um, but being a little further along, a lot of what I end up doing is reading other people's work and kind of giving feedback on it, hopefully constructive feedback. So whether that's papers for journals, or papers that I'm working on with co-authors, or grant applications, or giving feedback and advice to, to junior colleagues or to other students who reach out. Uh, there's a lot of time, but that's also a good way for me to learn 
you know, what's going on in the field and what are the two new techniques and what are people interested in? So that's another reason I would say going and reading things, reading what's happening now in the field, the working papers, not just the published papers, but the working papers, that's the sort of frontier of the field and that's what, that's what people are doing and how, how they're spending their time. Funding is potentially a big deal. Now in the EA community, we've heard there's lots of money, but um, it's also not an infinite amount and, and not everything. So uh, especially if you're not directly in the EA community, going and getting funding is also frankly how, how you spend part of the time, convincing people that what you're doing is worthwhile and that it's more worthwhile than the next best thing they could do with the money. Uh, there's, yeah, there's just a reasonable amount of time spent on that and, and other logistical aspects. Um, yeah, it's great to be around. I would say the, the kinds of people, it's, it's really, I mean, this is, this is true, you see this at the conference here, this is kind of true of EA in general, but I would say researchers, just curious people, like nice people to be around, tend to be quite, quite smart people, and so, so that's, a, that's a very nice aspect of it. It's also extremely international. I do development work, so that's particularly international. Um, but so yeah, I'm at the University of Exeter now, which is in some sense, okay, a, a provincial university in the UK. But in the economics department, I think we maybe have three people who are British on the faculty out of 40 people on the faculty, something like that. So it's, you know, it's just people from all over the world and that's the conferences are all over. And, and I really like that aspect of it. I think that's, that's really nice as well. The World Bank obviously was great, great for that as well. Been fairly fast. All right, let me pause there. I can always just keep talking, but let me stop and say like, all right, is there clarification questions or something I haven't mentioned that you were sort of expecting to come up or something about what I've said that you'd like to know more about or something else? It's, it's a bit of both. Uh, yeah, it's a good question, and, and it, it does happen different ways. Uh, one of the things, so, um, very quick, this doesn't affect any of you. There's something called REF in the UK, the Research Excellence Framework. Different academic departments are ranked every seven years. Uh, it's a big deal. Anyway, they, they talk about impact there, and they have this very stylized model of impact where you publish research in a journal, usually, and then it gets sort of translated and taken over to could be policymakers, it could be firms, it could be NGOs, you know, it could be local government or not, it could be anything. They just want sort of real world impact. But they really have this model of like, first it gets published, first it's a piece of academic research and then it goes. And, and when I was trying to sort of fit some of my work in there, it didn't fit so well because sometimes I'm working with the NGO or the firm or the government together. And so we might have had an impact even if the paper, because academic timelines are slow, as I've said, the paper might not get published for five years, but they're already using what we've done and either implementing it or learning about, in my case, they could be learning about behavioral science and taking that somewhere else. They could be learning about impact evaluation and rigorous monitoring evaluation and using that elsewhere. Uh, so that's just to say there are different routes and, and historically there's been this one idea, but I think it can be, it can be quite broader. Um, when you're working with governments, it's, which I said, is, is not, the, not the easiest partners to have. And this is all governments, this is, not, this is the US government very much as well. Um, but it does give you this automatic inroad, like at least, at least you've got a personal connection. Often you know what they're interested in because at least part of what you've done has been responsive to the questions they have. So you know it's something that's going to be potentially of interest to them. You need to, I mean, I, I want to and need to find something that's, I think, also academically interesting, intellectually interesting. Sometimes those are the same. Sometimes those are two different things on the same project where I have kind of an arm that I think is telling me something more fundamental about economics and social science. And they have an arm that's telling them how best to do something operationally they need to do. And that's great. So we find that common ground. And so I know that it's going to be at least a little bit of interest. Uh, but even then, it can be, it can be very hard. Um, I do, there's, I've, done, I've done some private sector consulting as well. And there's one, the, so the government of a large, rich Middle Eastern country, let's just say that, hired a consulting firm to help them set up uh, behavioral science within the government. Consulting firm found me because that's something I've worked on. And so I was, this was a couple of months ago, I think in January, I was on a call with five ministers, you know, ministerial level people and from health and finance and education this large country. So that was one where they were, if you sort of, you have to invest the time, you have to become the person who is 
one of the people who knows about this. Uh, but that's if you're willing to put in the time, you can do that. Like anybody can do that, and then and then you will be one of the one of the ones who they listen to and want to want to reach out to. You know, I wish I could point to some really great success stories. I think we're getting there, uh, but uh, it's it's probabilistic, as I said. It's hard to know what the counterfactual would have been in those cases. There were a couple of others. That, you know, that, yeah. Yeah, great, great question. I would say not, I would say learning um, skills, whether that's like statistics, econometrics, data analysis type skills, or, or, you know, project management type skills, doing some of that early on is really useful because you'll be able to apply that different places. And because frankly, that will make you attractive. There are a lot of people who need those kinds of skills and a lot of organizations. And if you can bring that in addition to whatever else you want to do, that's, that's marketable. I mean, not in a very, in a very good way. But disciplinarily, I wouldn't focus too much. You have to pick something. So I, yeah, so I have a PhD in economics, but I've worked in schools of public policy and schools of public health and business schools. And there are people who get PhDs from those schools. But frankly, I think even though in some ways that, that seems interdisciplinary, I actually think that limits you a little bit more than having a pure disciplinary background like economics or psychology or data science which can then be used all kinds of places. So I actually see that as more flexible as having, I wouldn't focus too much on a particular topic within economics, but having this sort of way of thinking, the disciplinary focus, that then you can apply and do all kinds of, all kinds of other things with. There was, there was at least one more I saw. No? Maybe it's been answered. Yeah. I think it does. I think it has increased a little bit. And of course, there's a confound here of like the world is changed again, not that I'm old or anything, but the world has changed a little bit in the last few years since when I started. Um, and my position has changed. So it's hard for me to disentangle those those precisely. I think things have gotten probably a bit more competitive. I do think it was a bit easier. I think that there are a lot of good things about the fact that it's more competitive. I think it's partly um, more people are doing this, a more diverse set of people are coming to this field. It's just a broader set of people interested in research, but that does mean, although the pie has gotten bigger, I don't think it's gotten as much bigger as the set of people trying to, trying to get at the pie. Um, but yes, there's also a sense of most places, um, juniors are protected from that as much as possible. So you start to draft the learning the process, but it's supposed to be the more senior people who set up a lab or whatever who, who who support that and, and so for instance junior faculty in, in my department don't have admin responsibilities and don't particularly have fundraising responsibilities for anything anything like that so there is there is more but I think on the, yeah I, I think it's I would do things differently if I were setting up the world but I but I don't think it's too bad and I think it's understandable that that there's there's you know some of this that has to happen anything else I can, yeah. Right. Um, okay. um, yeah, thanks. And as I said, I'm happy to, happy to chat more. So feel free to reach out if you want to ask any other questions. Or I'll be also, I, I'm leaving later today, but I think I'll be, I have a little bit of open space later, maybe like three or four o'clock today if you're around and try to find me. Thanks. Great to see everyone. Good luck. Enjoy the conference. Oh, thank you.